bigger thighs. So I'm always going to fill out the thigh column in a leg. That's just because my thighs are kind of juicy. So if you have smaller thighs, they may not actually fill out the thigh. So don't assume that because my thigh is filling it out that yours will as well. Take into account that I have abnormally large thighs because of lipidemia. So uh, just something to think about. So let's start at the beginning. I was diagnosed with a condition called lipedema. And I don't even remember exactly when I first found out. I remember how I found out. A doctor who specializes in treating lipedema reached out to me and said, I'm pretty sure you have this. And then from there, a nurse reached out to me, someone who worked in the charitable arm of an organization that researches lipedema reached out to me. Basically, I, I had a lot of professionals in the area of studying lipedema reach out to me and tell me that I have this condition. And when I first found out, I was like annoyed and mad that these people had reached out to me. Um, and I ignored it and I was just like, screw you, I'm gonna do whatever I want. And then eventually, even when I accepted it, I still didn't make any changes in my life. I was just like, whatever, I'm gonna progressively gain weight forever. I might as well like have fun while that's happening. So I did exactly opposite of what someone should do when they are diagnosed with a, a condition, especially a progressive disorder. I just basically said two sheets to the wind. I'm going to live my best life, eat whatever I want and do whatever I want because I have this condition. So why shouldn't I? Um, that was a very immature response to this diagnosis. And in the beginning, it really didn't affect my life that much to be, to be entirely candid. Originally, it was like, oh, my butt and thighs are bigger than the rest of my body. Big whoop. But then things started to change. <laughs> things started to change. About a year ago, I started to see like things change a lot, right? I started, the bruises became more frequent. I got varicose veins. And I just was like, okay, maybe I need to start doing something. So I started researching about lipedema. And there were just all these really extreme diets that were suggested. And honestly, a lot of the people who are actively talking about lipedema practice those diets. So I chose keto because I like meats and cheeses and I did keto and I actually developed a really terrible keto rash all over my body. I was itching and twitching for days and it was literally the worst. One of the worst experiences of my life was the like couple months I did keto. And I remember crying to my friend on the phone, like literally calling her up and bawling my eyes out and basically being like, I can't do this. I can't keep this crazy diet. I couldn't do it, you know, before and I can't do it now. And it, it was weird because I was doing a crazy diet for the right reasons, but it was still a crazy restrictive diet. And it, it still had all the terrible physical and mental consequences, even though the intention of doing it might have been pure. Is it pure? I don't know. And I, I, began to get really anxious because I felt like those were the only solutions being presented to me. Like with lipedema, there is no cure. There's no pill you take. You have to either adapt your lifestyle to stop the progression or limit the progression, or you continue to progress and eventually lose mobility. I felt very defeated. And for like six months, I probably felt super defeated because I felt like I had lost control of my own body and I was not capable of doing the things I needed to do to get in control of it. And I didn't understand why it behaved the way it did. And during Corona, um, it got really bad. And I remember I have this big chair I sit in. I love to sit and edit in that chair. And I remember sitting in it and it got so hard to get up. And it was more the pain in my legs than anything. And I just remember feeling so defeated. I like to think of myself as superwoman and I'm not. And now I have this, this thing in my life that I can't control that just makes everything so much harder. I had some things going on in my life that weren't great. So I cleaned those up and I said, I gotta be in a mental place to make changes that can work for me, that can work for me long-term. So I started researching just balancing diet and how to figure out what you should be eating as like a normal human being, not as like a, I wanna lose a bajillion pounds person, but just like as a, I just wanna be healthier. And I saw, this video and it was a dietitian and she said 
people think about um, our diets as, as restricting, like what can I take out of my diet? When they really should be thinking about food as what can I put into my diet? What can I add to my diet for it to be more balanced? So I got online, I found this company called Snap Kitchen that makes like healthy balanced meals without like a lot of preservatives and really focuses on like the concept of providing energy in, in what we eat. So I bought every meal for every day of the week. And I started that way and they would get delivered to me every other day. And what I said to myself is I can eat these meals and if I get hungry at the end of the day and I need more food, that's okay. And I can have whatever I want, but I'm going to make sure that I start first with all of the nutrients my body needs. And in two weeks, my cravings changed. I began to notice that sugar makes me feel yucky and causes me to crash a lot. So I significantly cut down on my consumption of sugar. I also began to notice that I previously could not tell when I was full or when I needed food. And so there were a lot of signals that I was ignoring that I was starting to like experience again. And it was, it was wild. It was wild how much making that change changed me and also how much my eating habits naturally changed as a result. So after I got my food under control, um, I was like, I can't stop here, right? I still feel challenged in movement. So I just said, I'm going to walk a mile and a half, five days a week. Now, at that point, I was having severe back pain as well. So... I would walk, uh, wow, maybe like half a mile and my back would start to ache and I would have to bend over, I would have to stretch it out and then I would have to keep on going. And I, and honestly, those walks in the beginning were so incredibly hard. My legs hurt, they felt bloated and heavy. My back was a mess and you know, it was hot. So that doesn't help any of this. And I did it anyway, I did it anyway. And in two weeks, my back pain was gone, just completely gone. I missed this. I missed being outside. I had worked out like occasionally, but I missed the consistency. I missed the progression. I missed um, being outside. I missed doing it with data. And I started to say, you know what? This has to be a priority. This so I started all of this, never with the intention of losing weight, but to try to balance my pain. I have, you know, made a lot of changes. I don't really drink anymore. I've had alcohol twice in the last three, I guess, three months now, three, three and a half months. So on July 28th, 2020, I posted a video. I think it was called something like weight loss, diets, and etc. And then I posted two subsequent videos. I did not anticipate the amount of discussion this would generate online. So I shut up about it. I hunkered down and I decided to just not talk about it anymore. That doesn't mean I stopped working on it. Part of the reason, and not all of the reason, I still have lip edema, I still have that condition to work with with all of this, but part of the reason I am overweight is because of the drama in my life and because of the ways I coped with it. That doesn't change the fact that I also have lip edema. So like, I don't even know at this point what I can fix and what I can't, which is incredibly frustrating because I now feel based on my own discovery and my own work in a lot of ways that my body is a shield I don't need anymore. Well, my body in the way that it is right now. I several years ago, lost a lot of weight and was in a lot of, uh, was in really good health. I was never thin. I was still plus size, but I was running, I was biking, I was exercising. I was, I was enjoying my life at a physical level that brought me an immense amount of joy. The reason that changed, and this is something I haven't ever discussed, but maybe people could have alluded from my videos is I worked for a company that pushed me into the ground burnt me out to a level I've never been and honestly emotionally was not healthy and it triggered a lot of stuff brought back bad habits and because I hadn't done the work and I hadn't done the energy I made bad choices not that eating is a bad choice but I made choices that took away my own joy
now I'm in this situation where, God, I don't even know where I can go from here. But all I know is that returning to that active lifestyle, eating a more balanced diet that can fuel that level of activity is the way that I am going to release this shield, if that makes sense. <laughs> I, I know that there's things I need to do, like I need to see an endocrinologist and I need to kind of look into more uh, diverse ways to treat my lipedema, which I will eventually cover, but I need to figure it out on my own first. Um, but I felt very frustrated and I have been pushing myself and angry at myself because things aren't working out the way I want them to. And it's hard when you are trying and it's not working the way you want it to work. And you literally feel like you're pushing your body to like the farthest it can go. And and still there's people online who are calling you lazy and telling you all you do is eat and like just ripping you to shreds. I think it hurts more when you're actually doing the work and you're actually trying. I honestly and fervently believe that everybody's relationship with food is fucked up in some way. And I think there's no other way to say it than that. Um, I legitimately feel that nobody has a healthy relationship with food because it's in, it's in, and I hate to say this, but it's not in corporate America's best interest for us to have healthy, balanced relationships with food. I might have done more harm than good because I myself am working through issues and realizing where I'm at and what I can and cannot change. And the hard part about that is I do this publicly, right? Like I don't shy away from talking about my feelings and my feelings are bound to change and evolve and grow as I learn about my body. And I still feel like I'm on a journey for health and I'm on a journey to make better decisions for myself. But I've also seen that like, it's not as simple as I thought it was gonna be. And it may not look the way I ultimately want it to look. And I think that is devastating. And it's not something I necessarily want to accept. I'm mad at myself because I still haven't found a general practitioner and that's because I'm scared. Not that they're gonna find something wrong, but that They'll tell me that like, after all the tests and all the things that I should be losing weight and that, that I'm just doing something wrong. And I think that will devastate me because I've put so much energy into trying to make these changes and to have them not work out in the way I want them to is crushing. And I think honestly, it's, it's fucked up my feeling and relationship with food even more because it felt like something I could change and I don't know if it is. And that is the, the worst feeling on the freaking planet. And I'm not asking for an excuse. Like, I think that's the hardest thing too, is people, people like, oh, you just want an excuse to be fat. No, I am take full ownership of this. And to be completely honest, I got here because previously in my life, I made bad choices and I'm not gonna sit here and pretend like that's not true. But I will say over the past two years, I have been steadily working on making changes and to not see any of that reversed. It's not like I get to go back, right? A lot of people get to go back because of lipedema. I don't necessarily get to. And so now I have to really consider things like surgery. And I have to consider things like my body might just be like this, that like the ultimate win might be just not gaining weight, which I haven't gained weight for those past two years. I just feel like maybe my relationship with food is way more fucked up than I ever thought it was. And I don't have any answers. This is no magical solution, guys. There is no magical solution to this. I just hope I'm not hurting anybody as I try to figure this out on my own. I have a responsibility to be open and honest about the good and the bad. And I think when I was excited and happy about what was going on, it was easy. But now that like, I just feel like it's all falling apart, it doesn't feel great, you know? I think I'm at a point right now where I don't know if change is possible. 
not necessarily changing my habits, but changing my body. I, and I'm going to keep trying. I guess that's the easiest way to say it. But I'm going to focus less on results right now because that that is tearing me apart and may never be an option for me. I may never be able to lose some of this weight and I need to just even say, see, I can't even accept that it, that I, that I, like, I may not be able to lose weight. I just need to be able to say that I may not be able to lose weight, not some of the weight, not part of the weight. I may not be able to lose weight in the way that everybody else loses weight. And because of that, I might have to be creative. I might have to do things differently. And that is the reality of it. And it's okay. It ain't great, but things could be a lot worse. As hard as this is, I do feel like there's hope. I just feel like maybe I've wasted some time focusing on the wrong things. And so I need to buck up, accept my reality, and I need to go see a doctor. I just, I need to just go see a doctor. I wanna say eight, nine months ago, I decided to start working out. This was around the same time I made a lot of other changes as far as like what I ate. Uh, I treated a lot of previously untreated medical issues and I also decided that I was going to try some weight loss medication. All of those things together basically have transformed my life. I did lose around 90 pounds on this journey and that's with a lot of complications that traditionally make losing weight very difficult. I have Hashimoto's and I also have lipedema. <laughs> In one week, I am having surgery to address my lipedema. About two years ago, I started talking about my health journey. And in the beginning, I was really open about everything going on. But as time went on, there was just so much criticism and it, it affected my mental health. And I also was afraid that I would start making decisions based on what people thought of me versus what was actually best for me. So I decided at that point, to pull back and to allow myself the time to make the right decisions. And that with the intention of maybe not ever sharing it. But now I feel a responsibility to share it because I genuinely feel like I dealt with my condition too late and I can be honest about that. And I am working on not punishing myself for that because I think it's, it's an unfair thing to punish myself for, but it's something I, I deeply feel right now when I therapy is great I'll get through it but right now I'm not and if I can help somebody else get the treatment and care they need and figure out how to do that I want to be that person because I don't want anyone else to go through what I'm going through right now so I have lost about 100 pounds and in January I stopped losing weight I was taking Wagovi. I know I've never talked about my medication before, but it is important to the story. Um, so I'm going to talk about it here and I'm not endorsing anything. You should go see your doctor for any medical treatment. It's just important to the storyline. So I've been on the Wagovi for about, I'm gonna say eight months and I just stopped losing weight. And I was keeping around an 1800 to 2000 calorie diet and I was training for my 5K. And I was tracking just like everything according to what I needed to be my best and healthiest self. And so it was very frustrating. So my doctor was like, well, maybe we'll try a different medication. Um, Zepbound goes up higher in its dosages. Maybe you just need a higher dosage. Um, I ended up having a really bad allergic reaction. And uh, it also made me hungry versus stabilizing my appetite. So it was just, it was not good for me. And I also started to have like pain and we thought that that was related to the allergic reaction because you know allergic reactions can cause inflammation and all kinds of other things. Didn't pay any mind to it, detoxed off the medication, went back on to a gopi, and then I felt great again. Still wasn't losing weight. So my doctor was like maybe it's just a plateau. What happened is I went to the doctor again, still wasn't losing weight. So she was like we're gonna try a different medicine combo, but I think you need to see somebody about your lipedema before we make any big decisions. And I was like, okay. And I literally just felt like 
they're gonna tell me the same things that I've heard from every doctor. And I've heard about my lip edema from my obesity specialist, which was who I was seeing, my vascular surgeon because of like my spider veins and circulatory issues as a result of lip edema, also from my primary care doctor. And I just felt like it was gonna be like the dry brushing, the self lymphatic massage, wearing compression socks, compression pants if I can find ones that fit me correctly, which I couldn't at the time, um, changing my diet, which I'd already done, exercising, maybe reducing the high impact stuff. Like I knew that that's what I was gonna hear and so I didn't expect anything different, right? I saw several doctors and every single one of them said the same thing, which was that I was very close to losing mobility, which was extremely shocking to me because I felt great. I didn't have pain. I, my inflammation was like under control. So I was like, I'm fabulous, right? I made the decision to have surgery, scheduled the appointment, and um, started the process of prepping for surgery. And again, I'm still feeling pretty good at this point. As part of surgery protocol, you have to go off GLP-1s and several other medications, okay? Just because they thin the blood or they can cause problems with anesthesia. I started to go off of the Wagovi. And <laughs> it's it's been really honestly terrible. I don't have another word for it. Like I always had some pain. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I have a really high pain tolerance. Um, but this was, this was new and this was hard. And it felt as if I had regressed all the way back. The first week I was off it, um, I started to just have pain in my legs, uh, feeling like a giant bruise. Second week I was off it, um, I started to have difficulties like walking distances. You know, for me, walking five to six miles in a day was pretty normal. And now I was walking like two, three miles and things started to really hurt. My workouts started to become really, really hard. It was as if my muscles had just magically atrophied. I am afraid that a lot of the work I've done on my mobility and the way my body works to kind of help uh, counter my hyperextension may be gone. I have a feeling it's gone because I'm starting to have pain in my ankle again and I haven't had pain in my ankle since I did that and I just like, I have to do this assessment in like a couple days and I am like terrified she's gonna tell me that, I, that I'm locking my legs again because I worked so freaking hard to not do that. But it's, but it's, just my body trying to stop the pain I'm living in. And it feels like everything I fought for for the last two years has just been like ripped out of my hands. And there's new pain, pain that I didn't have when I started my health journey. I know surgery is gonna help, but it all seems really overwhelming right now. I can't help feeling like a failure. And I, and I know sharing this, I am going to get shredded online. I know that that is, what so many people are gonna do. Everything I say, someone is gonna tell me I'm wrong. And I am really grateful that I made the decision to not share this until I was ready. Cause I don't know if I would have made the decision that I've made, but I ultimately know it's the right decision. For the last two years, being physically active has become a huge part of my life and my joy. And I just want it back. And I'm gonna keep fighting to get it back because I deserve to have joy. I deserve to be happy. I deserve to move in my body freely. And I don't deserve this pain. I'm not the problem. The condition is the problem. And that's hard because like, as a bigger body, you're just gaslit your whole life to feel like you're the problem. I know that surgery is the right option, but I am so afraid that it won't solve the problem. I hope for two things. One, I hope that, that this works. And two, I hope that content like this will help other people. If you feel like you are trapped in your body, and this isn't about aesthetics, this isn't about looking cute or being enclosed, but it's okay to pursue changes in your body for those reasons, but I am talking about a very different feeling when you feel like your body is fighting you see somebody about it and don't just see like a random person on the internet like go see a doctor 
it seems like I'm producing lipidemic cells faster than I'm burning like healthy fat cells, which is part of the reason I stopped losing weight. I'm just mad I didn't do this sooner. And a lot of the reason I didn't do it sooner is because I, and this is so hard to say, I was scared of the optics because I wanted to believe I could do it myself. And it felt like pursuing surgery, pursuing medical treatment was me being a failure. And that is just simply not it. You are not a failure if you seek treatment. You are not a failure if you accept your condition. You are not a failure if you want to stop the pain. You cannot, especially if you're in the later stages like I am, just magically eat well and exercise it away. I am living proof of that. But I know for me and my body, I have done everything right. And I have to, I have to take solace in that, that I have done everything I possibly could do on my own. And it's not worked. There is always going to be someone that wants me to be a villain but I don't need to be that villain in my life anymore. I don't need to be the person that's mean to me anymore. I don't, I don't need to be that. And so me getting this surgery and taking care of myself and continually fighting for me is really, is really part of being kind to myself. And if people can't see that, it's, those people don't serve me. I've spent a lot of my life hiding my pain because I felt like a burden. And I just want to know, you to know if you feel that way. And this is something I've literally learned in like the last two days. The people in your life that love you will understand. So I would say let those people in. Let those people know your pain. You're not a burden. <laughs> Hi, my name's Anna, and if you're new here, I have a condition called lipedema. And at the time of filming this, I am five days post-op my first lipedema removal surgery, which I had on my outer thighs and upper hip shelf. I decided going through this journey that it was really important to document it. Not a lot of people know about my condition, and a lot of the information that's out there is frankly not accurate. <laughs> so I wanted to try to provide insights and um, knowledge about my condition and also the process of treating it. So first and foremost, about two months ago, I ultimately decided against local doctors because some of them had BMI requirements or they just did not have enough experience with advanced stage cases. I am a stage four patient. Which I'm a little nervous right now because I'm going to my first appointment with um, a lipid Dema removal specialist in Los Angeles um, to see if I'm ready to start that process. From what I know and what I've seen, this process might take up to two years for me. And in talking with my other medical team members, they think that it's best for me and my health to start the process now. Over the last six months, I've had a lot of trouble losing weight. My body's changed, but I haven't lost weight and I had started to really punish myself for it, um, reducing calories further, working out more. It wasn't healthy. And I saw my um, obesity doctor and she was like, well, maybe we need to try a different medication. Maybe we need to do these things. And so we had proceeded down that path and I still really haven't been having like tons of results, but we knew that it might take time. Today, meeting with the lipedema specialist, I'm gonna have to have a lot of surgeries to get it removed. And I've kind of been lying to myself a little bit about the pain that I experience on a day-to-day -day basis, or I've been trying to live through the pain. It just is like really exciting, but also like really scary. And I feel like mad at myself for being so hard on myself. I just feel a lot of things right now. I guess I should feel happy because I know I'm I'm not crazy and it's not because I'm not working hard enough or I'm not eating right. But at the same time, um, this is going to be several years to resolve and it's going to be very, very expensive. And um, it's just a lot. It's just a lot to take on. And um, well, there's a lot of hope at the end of the tunnel, it just... It was more today than I thought. I guess I just want to be at the end. I'm sick of going through it. I'm just really sick of going through it. And I think this is a thing that no one talks about when they talk about health is that 
we love before and after pictures. We love seeing people before and after and how their bodies change, but we don't acknowledge the time that is in between and the struggle and the journey and the pain. And I'm gonna tell you, it's a very painful process. So now I have another appointment tomorrow at 9.15 and I have to do everything I did today all over again. And that was already really emotionally taxing. And I can only imagine that if I don't have a similar conversation, but then it will also be confusing and I'm just, I'm tired. I'm tired of medical stuff. I'm done. After my first doctor's review, I felt really anxious and uncomfortable. And after this appointment, I feel very hopeful and excited. I ultimately decided to go with Dr. David Amron at the Roxbury Institute, who runs the Advanced, Lim Advanced Lipedema Treatment Program. As part of getting lipedema covered by insurance, one of the things they really like stress to you is that you're able to articulate how much the condition has affected your life. So in order to kind of do that and show you guys on video, we went to a gym where I was staying in New York for something totally unrelated to this um, and just filmed some issues that I'm currently having with mobility. Now, if you watch my last video, you know that when I was on Wagovi, it did help my inflammation a lot. So I did have a little bit, like actually a lot more mobility and less pain, but coming off of it has kind of really exposed uh, how bad the condition is affecting the actual underlying you know, fabric of my life. And the reality is, is like eventually the Wagovi will not be able to help solve this problem. So we need to drill with, deal with it before it gets to that point. So we did our own like kind of little video assessment. Two weeks ago, I could easily do this, but in coming off the medication, I can't even, I can't even do the pose anymore. I knew I needed to film this just so I could see the progress after surgery, but I didn't, I didn't realize how much it would hurt. I can't, I can't hide the fact that my body is not okay. Everywhere there's lipedema feels like a bruise right now. And I've noticed that I've started having some lymphedema in my lower extremities, which I've never had before. I wore compression socks to sleep last night. My joints are fiery. They're just not as mobile as they were literally just two weeks ago. Everything feels harder. Like everything feels heavier and more difficult to move. It feels like a betrayal right now. It feels like it is fighting me and fighting what's best for me. And I am seeing the things I worked really hard for just not be possible anymore. It's hard, it's hard. And I am trying to keep my wits about me, but I am so frustrated with my body because before when I hurt I legitimately thought it was because I was out of shape but now I'm realizing that it was a little bit more complex than that yes I was out of shape but also my body was actively fighting against me moving just awaiting a treatment that should work but may not and that's that scary too like it's a big deal it's not like a it's not a five minute procedure and, but now I feel like it's my only hope because I can't live like this. Okay, so I'm gonna touch from here all the way up. This, these, like if you can see, they're literally like drags. So these are pockets of lipidemic fat here. And when I push the skin together, you can see those pebbles. You can see those are the lipidemic cells. So that's, that's what's causing me to pain. This actually freaking hurts, but I think it's important to show people what it looks like. So it looks like that. Um, I have a lot of pain here and especially right here. Um, if I sit in a chair and this touches the side of the chair, it will physically be painful. Okay, so on the arms, I have a combination of loose skin and lipedema. So this is predominantly my lipedema. And as you can see, when we squeeze it, we get a weird texture again. I don't know if it's, it's not as easy to squeeze here because there's some loose skin as well. Fast forward a couple days, we were able to get some support from um, Dr. Amron's team and to actually meet with an occupational therapist who specializes in basically writing to insurance the ways that 
your mobility and quality of life has been affected by lipedema. I don't have the pump. So um, because I was losing weight, I wore compre like full compression for a while. But then I basically sized out of it. So it was on my list to purchase new gear or get custom gear made. Yeah. Um, and now I'm going into surgery. So it's kind of a mute point. Sure. Um, do you wear compression socks a lot? Mm -hmm. uh, I do. I know how to do basic lymphatic massage on myself and dry brushing. <laughs> I am strong. And the thing that's most frustrating to me about this illness is all I want to do is be more active. I started my health journey to be more active and I still have things I can't do. And yeah. I am pissed about it because yeah. I have spent two years doing everything right. And all it's done is made me fall in love mm -hmm. with being active. And now my body won't let me do the thing I love. And that mm -hmm. is so cruel. It's so okay. unfair. So once we had the assessment, uh, a lot of things became really clear. First and foremost, some of the things that I thought were weight-related problems probably were a little bit weight-related problems, but were also lipedema problems. Second thing that I realized is that I had some pain that had come to progress in my arms that I did not have previously. And it was now affecting my range of motion as well as my strength. Third thing I noticed is, especially being off the Wagovi, is that my joints were a little bit more hyperextended and that I was starting to cheat uh, back how I used to walk, which is locking my legs and hyperextending so that I don't have to distribute the weight on my knee at all. So at this point in the walking exercise, and I had been feeling great, like I was freaking crushing it. This is where the physical therapist tells me that my gait is incorrect, that I've regressed. And as you can see, um, I, I don't take it well. This moment was the moment that I realized that I wasn't crazy for doing the surgery. I'd and basically be like, screw you guys. I really do need this done. Because I now knew that if I didn't do it, that this was going to be my reality, except worse. And I wasn't willing to accept that reality. To be really honest, I'm not willing to accept a life where I have a loss of mobility, where I can't run, where I can't have adventures, where I can't hike, where I can't swim, where I can't just live the way I want to live. That's what this whole journey has been about up until this point. If you've been following my whole journey, was being getting back to the things I love and enjoy. I've had a taste of that over the last two years, and I am definitely not willing to give it up. So... While it was emotionally very difficult to have to see the actual flaws in my body and what it's capable of right in front of me with a mirror that I could not look away from, it was ultimately super important because it helped me be so confident going into that surgery that this was my only option that there was no more conservative treatments, that there was no magic from Wagovi, that like this had to be dealt with. I think I got very lucky that Wagovi helped me so much with inflammation and pain, but I'm kind of glad that this is happening because it makes me realize I do really need to do the surgery now because I am an incredibly active person. For me, this is a huge, huge step down from where I was you know at first it was not being able to do anything high impact so it was the jumping and the running were gone mm -hmm. then it was like lifting weights would exhaust me so much it's just like every week something new kind of slowly breaks down and I think it's just I'm just sick of like constantly seeing that as I progress towards the surgery and again I keep trying to remind myself that it's just more proof that I need to do it but it sucks so today we are headed to the Roxbury to do my pre-op assessment. As part of my process, in order to be able to best talk about this condition, I wanted to make sure I was working with the doctor because, as I like to say, I am not a doctor. Hashtag not a doctor. And the best medical advice should come from a doctor. So in order to do that, I was able to partner with ALT and be able to actually talk about this from a doctor's perspective. So what we're doing right now is just doing my testimonial for that doctor, Dr. Amran, and then um, and Dr. Mosrefi, who's doing my plastics. 
and then we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the actual um, pre-op work. I, I just Definitely. know that like doing this is going to help a lot of people, but I also know it's going to bring me a lot of um, hate. Yeah, I was I was showing him earlier. I can't. So I have a lot of fibrotic tissue. So that's as far as I can bend my knee. Yeah. And, that's and it. It's like physically obstructed. Yeah, no, I physically can't. Like, there's fibrotic tissue. It's hard. So now we are taking photos so we can see how my body looks before and after the various surgeries I'm going to have. So that is what this is. So the anesthesiologist called me last night. And they're like, we need to prepare you for, you know, what's going to happen tomorrow. So they don't put you completely see. You're like, I guess cognizant, but like can't you can you can tell that they're moving around down there and you can feel things, but you don't necessarily know what you're feeling. And apparently they talk to you throughout it, so but yet at the same time you're not there mentally. So I'm very <laughs> confused what this is gonna feel like. Dr. Amron's gonna come in and draw my body, make me art. Well actually it's my markers for the incisions and stuff. So Everybody's getting ready to film it. And I'm walking because I was sitting for so long that my, my knees are just bugging me now. So I'm just, and I'm anxious, so I'm pacing. That's what I'm doing. I'm pacing. Please. I'm close to crying. Yes, close to crying. <laughs> How are your knees? Not great. They evaluated? Um, no, I don't think it, muscle-wise, I think it's, oh, I think they're okay. But I mean, the joint itself's okay? I have not had them evaluated. So they're they're wrapping me now to go home. But basically, it's all of that stuff releasing from my body, which is good. It's gross, but it's good and it's healthy. Um, so it's vile how okay I feel after surgery. I'm alert. I'm a little bit shaky. Um, I can't feel anything they're doing. <laughs> which is weird and getting the compression garment on was less work than I thought it was going to be but then again they put it on me so maybe that's why mm -hmm. I just realized like it wasn't that hard to put it on when I realized I didn't put it on so maybe the pain and the, and the, the drugs are still in me a little bit so I just came out of my first surgery um, and I did my outside thighs and my hip shelf, I think it's what it's called. Um, they took out, I believe, 12 ish liters of lipidemic fat. And what Dr. Amor was telling me, which was like wild, said that it was like way more fibrotic than he initially had thought, which is means it's, again, really good that I took care of this now versus like waiting on it because it could have caused a lot more problems. I want to say shout out to Courtney, who was the anesthesiologist. She stayed with me the whole time. So anytime I had like any, like any discomfort, she was like on it. And I think because I had so much fibrotic tissue, like, you know, that happened a couple times, but it was, I never felt any true pain. It was just like a little like, oh, this might progress into that. And then she was like on it. 1030 at night. So I had my surgery finished around two. I feel fine. I'm actually like weirdly confused how okay I feel. Um, I was dancing. I walked a mile. <laughs> it's like better. It's better than when I get into surgery. So I don't think this is the norm, especially for someone in a stage four. But I'm... I'm not mad at it. <laughs> I have leaked a lot of fluids, but honestly, every time they've come out, I've just felt better and better. So I think it's just part of the process of feeling better. It's not, it's not the sexiest thing, but man, psh, I feel amazing. One of the things I've had a lot of questions about is what it's actually like post-surgery. And to be entirely candid, I did a ton of research um, before I went into surgery to try to prepare myself. And that research did not serve me because what I've learned is everybody's recovery experience is gonna be a little bit different based on your body, based on your lifestyle, based on just a lot of things. 
So the first 24 hours after surgery, I felt freaking great. Guys, I am one day out of surgery and I am dancing with my nurse. Set, God. <laughs> and I don't know how I feel this good, but it's like a lot of pain is gone. And I feel freaking amazing and I just want to move. And that was for a couple of reasons. One, I still had a lot of drugs in my body. And let's just be honest about that. You don't just magically not have anesthesia anymore when they stop putting it in your body. It does linger for a little while. Additionally, I went into surgery with a lot of pain. I was kind of limpy when walking when I went into surgery. So having a lot of that fibrosis removed from my knee actually made my pain post-surgery less than it was going into surgery. And what was really wild is I felt that almost immediately. Even just the flexibility of my knee was greater. So I think it made my first 24 hours just like really great because my pain tolerance was basically accustomed to something much more unbearable. So the pain I was feeling was like, meh, nothing. One thing that they kind of prepare you for is that the first 48 hours past your surgery, you need help. Now that either needs to be a friend or a family member, or you can hire a CNA to kind of help you with everything. I chose a nurse and I'm very glad that I did. Now in the first 48 hours, I leaked a lot and especially in the first 24. One of the things that was very hard for me in the first 24 hours is that I could not be alone. There was someone kind of watching over me all the time. The first 24 hours and really through the rest of your recovery, movement is really important. And that's low impact, simple movement like walking. For me, we ended up putting on some good tunes and because I was leaking, it was really difficult to like go for a walk, especially that first 24 hours, you're just leaking a lot. So we just put on some tunes and I stood literally over a pad and I just did this shuffle back and forth, which was like walking but also like dancing. So whatever the music was, I just kind of danced to the beat. And honestly, it was fun. 24 hours after surgery, you get your first manual lymphatic drainage. We're going to get our manual lymphatic drainage. And that is where they basically help your lymphatic system process all the inflammation so it can naturally just like come out of you. This is Pearl who you guys just met. Hi. And she's gonna be doing my manual lymphatic drainage, which yes. is gonna help like activate my lymphatic system and help me process all the extra juicy juicy that's inside of me. So it's gonna get a little, it's gonna get a little nasty. I'm been a nasty yeah. girl. But hey. it's, it's gonna make me feel fantastic. So over the next kind of like four days, that's how I lived, right? Get up in the morning, go to MLD. Sometimes I would have bandaging, sometimes I don't. I would also pretty much wake up, go for a walk, go to MLD, come home and sleep, go for another walk if I could. But I was making sure to eat regular meals and just drink so much water. And honestly, if you wanna recover well, that would be the one thing I would say is just drink as much water as you possibly can. It will feel like too much, it is never enough. Okay, so I've done it. I've come down to breakfast and I am sitting upright, like in an upright position for the first time in three days and it feels actually really good. So um, I'm gonna try to do more of this. I might try to clear off that bench in the room and try to like sit in the bench and work, which is sad, but you know what? It's something to keep me upright, but I feel good. I feel really good. After I kind of got through this process, I got to the point where A, I could care for myself and B, I was ready for my first shower. Showering for the first time, it is a, it is a whole thing. That is the easiest way to say it, it's a whole thing. First of all, you've been in compression for 24 seven and anytime you've been out of it, you've been with nurses who are helping you in and out of the garment, okay? There, you are a faint risk. And probably the most common thing I see post-surgeries that people talk about is fainting, taking off the garment for the first shower. Luckily, I was prepared for this and I knew how to do it so I wouldn't faint. So I'll just tell you what I did. Hopefully it'll work for you too. First, drink a whole bunch of water two hours before you actually plan to shower. A lot of the fainting risk is due to dehydration and also changes in blood pressure, and you can just help yourself mitigate that by drinking a lot of water. When I took my garment off, I took it off slowly and I immediately laid down. I did not go directly to the shower. I laid down for about 10 minutes to let my body just stabilize to not having the garment on. Once I had been rested for about 10 minutes, 
I then went to the shower. I showered in cold as hell water, like as cold as you can possibly get it. If you're not screaming when you get under the, the water coming down, you're not doing it right. A, it's gonna keep you awake. B, it's gonna work with your lymphatic system, not piss it off, because hot water really can make your body angry. And you'll see often with autoimmune disorders, drink like bathing in cold water is ideal, right? So I took the shower in cold water, immediately went back to bed immediately went back and laid down. I did not try to put my garment on right away. I dried off in bed, laying down prostrate like this, drinking water. And then once I was dry and I felt okay, like I hadn't expended too much energy, I sat and put my compression garments on to my knees, rested again, then pulled them all the way up. Then, you know what I did right after that? I rested some more. So the key to not fainting is just very slowly going through the process. As you heal, this actual procedure isn't necessary, but in the first 10 days, if you're gonna shower, this probably is what you should do. I took my first shower at day four and I followed the same strategy when I showered again, I think on day seven and day 10. After day 10, I no longer kind of followed all this protocol. One thing I'm gonna definitely do different in my next surgeries is prep my bed before I go. A typical bed preparing, if you're still leaking, is a plastic sheet and then using different pee pads on top. Um, I leaked for about two days after when I came home. Some people leak for a very long time. Some people heal very quickly. It just depends on your body. One of the hardest things that I would say you need to do, and you need to do this well beyond, like well before your surgery, is to find a massage therapist with the right credentials to actually do your bandaging and your MLD therapy after. One thing I didn't know about the bandages because my bandages did not fall down while I was um, recovering in the first week is when they fall down is when you can change your garments. Additionally, I was supposed to walk, but not too much, which is also a hard thing, right? Like I'm used to walking a lot. It's an important part of my day. So I was literally having to like schedule quarter mile walks four times a day. And I'm going to tell you what, it's just not very fulfilling. I'd rather just do a mile walk, right? Or two miles walk. But the point is, is that you're trying to get your lymphatic system moving every time you walk. And if you're doing it just once a day, well then you aren't getting as much of that movement because you're only moving it once a day. So this is where I walk and I love it because it's got all these wildflowers. So even though it's hot and terrible, um, at least I get to look at something pretty while I'm doing it. Plus, Data loves this because it's like a sniff safari. But what kind of sucks for me is I know I'm going back into another surgery, right? So I don't really get to resume everything because I also need to prep and prepare for the next surgery. So that means not pushing myself too hard that I get sick or that I'm not in the best physical shape for, for my next surgery. But what I did choose to do during week four, which I think was really, really smart, was to find creative ways to move, right? To start introducing movement that maybe had been off limits due to the intensity or the length before, but in ways that still met my protocol. So I started finding fun places to walk, things like the mall, Michael's, Costco, Walmart. And you know what? You can waste a lot of time and walk slowly and see lots of weird things that you don't need and then subsequently buy because again, you're emotional <laughs> and you don't have the same self-control you normally have. I also loved when my incisions healed because then I was able to go into the pool. Did I have to wear compression under my swimsuit? Yes but being in the pool was the most magical thing for me because it felt like getting a piece of what I love most back. And really one of the reasons I'm doing these surgeries is to be able to be outside and explore nature more. So it's not exactly what I wanted, but it gave me the ability to be outside, to feel the sun on me. And I did feel like a massive mood shift when I could be in the sun again. Around four weeks, I found myself like a lot more mentally clear as well. And I also found myself thinking of ways to like sustain what I'd done. So I started looking into more like conservative treatments and things like that. So I got one of those vibration boards. I got a trampoline. Obviously I'd been on a waiting list for a tactile pump, which is like the big pump that goes on your legs and, and mimics MLD that you use every day. So I got fit for that. So I started really facing the fact that my lifestyle for the rest of my life was gonna have to change. That was really positive in some ways, but also very difficult. And I think, I'm going to be honest, I was a little delusional. I went into surgery with the mental thought that once all of the surgeries would be done, I would be magically healed and I would not have to do all of the things I was doing previously. And that is just not the reality. 
So kind of that, that four week period, I started making plans for long-term care. I want people to realize that like, that is a very emotionally difficult journey. When you get the diagnosis, you hear about surgery and you think that's my magical solution, but it is literally only the beginning of how your life is going to have to change in managing this. And I was doing other conservative treatments before. I know I didn't always share it on camera and there was a reason I didn't share it on camera and I don't really give a crap what anyone says about it, but the reality is I wasn't comfortable being the poster child for lipedema. I've been traveling with compression. I have been doing a lot of these things for a while and I would say not everything, <laughs> clearly not everything because there's a lot of things I've had to add. But I thought I can deal with these things. I've been doing them for years, but to know that even that, even the compression and the bandaging and the, and the socks and the changes in my diet and, you know, the Wagovi, which helped with inflammation for me, that that was still only 25%. Having to deal with all of this, with the added pressure of people having a ton of opinions about my choices, my journey, what I have and have not done, um, it sucks. Frankly, it sucks. But I believe educating people on this journey and educating people about this condition is important. Because candidly, if I had dealt with this 10 years ago, I may not have to do all these extra things. But now my life and my abilities are going to be diminished. And that is a hard thing for me to swallow. I am still holding out for the fact that maybe I have some miracle recovery, but I may not. And I also am very aware that because of the way healthcare works in not only the US, but many other countries, many people are not able to manage their condition. And I also hope that by making videos like this, that that changes as well. And I hope to be an advocate for that to change because it's frankly ridiculous that our healthcare system will pay for a gastric bypass, will pay for a knee replacement, will pay for vein surgery when they literally could just treat the root problem, which is lipedema.